did another, what was it, about five hours of driving today for the dealership. Oh, cool. That's, I mean, that's a long drive. That's like from, that's like me driving to Las Vegas. I mean, you know, one way, but I, I, yeah, yeah. five, five hours is that's, that's, that's a lot of time sitting in a car, especially with all the, the fumes in there. is like the so it was about two hours each way roughly but then with traffic it extended a little bit and then i had to wait around for the car uh, that i was picking up to be found because a lot of these places especially in when you get more into like the city uh dealerships they have multiple lots like they have their mm. main lot and then they down the road a little bit like storage areas the, for, yeah essentially yeah. for all of like the kind of um just the extra vehicles that they don't have enough room for. And that was the case with the one that I was picking up. So I had to wait for someone to be able to go over there, drive me over there to it. I had to make sure that I had all of like the floor mats and uh, wheel locks and all of that fun stuff in the back that would, uh, was part of the trade and then um, make sure the vehicle was gassed up and everything. But uh, yeah, yeah, especially driving that sort of distance, that'll, yeah. that'll take some gas. Yeah, it was something like uh, 100 miles, I think. Somewhere uh, around that. Yeah, yeah the, the vehicle that I picked up was all full of pollen. It was, oh. it was, it was a silver <laughs> car, but it looked closer to like a yellowish green. Oh. It was great. I'm like, all right, well, hopefully the vents don't pick this up too bad because yeah, just be dying on the way back. But uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, those rides aren't terrible, but at the same time, I'm like five hours, hundred bucks. How could I be making more money? in less time yeah. <laughs> reliably <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i see it as something that that would break up the monotony of the other stuff that you're doing um but still i mean that that is that is a long time to to sit there so yeah yeah i mean i will say the nice thing at least for this ride is i i try to listen to different podcasts while i'm going through these rides and the one that i listened to today was an interview an interview of tim ferris that was done by, I think, Modern Wisdom, something like that, mm -hmm. or a link in the show notes, but about a three hour long interview. So it filled up most of the driving time, which is always nice because then I don't have to worry about like, all right, what else am I going to put in my queue to flip the rear yeah. or if I have to break it up? And two things that I pulled from that that I thought were, there are two questions that kind of are in my head right now because of it. The one is, what relationships do you want to double down on? Tim was talking about how each year he kind of goes through, so like at the end of 2023, he'll stop and he'll reflect on the relationships that he had built and focused on in 2023. And he's kind of asked himself, like, of these five or 10 relationships, do I need to double down on some of these? Did I get from them or give to them what I wanted? And do I have the like the bandwidth to expand on these and to or to grow new relationships in the next year? Mm -hmm. Which kind of just gives me like puts that thought in my own head of like I said, what relationships do I want to double down on? Like even just looking at this year and the few relationships that I've started to kind of forge uh, the past few months and everything. And obviously having like this podcast. And the relationship that you and I have built that like it's not it's forged in spandex. Yes, and puppies and <laughs> no creativity. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and it's but it's it's not it's not like we are talking every single day. It's not like we're texting it back and forth all the time. It's we literally just have this one day a week that we meet just about every week and we just talk for an hour or so. Yeah. And like it, it's kind of funny because like the other question that's in my head is like, what are you doing right now that isn't aligning with your goals? And I, I kind of go back and forth on this podcast when it comes to that. Like this podcast, like when I first kind of conceptualized it, it was going to be something that was more philosophical. Like yeah, that was more of like let's sit down each week and have these deeper conversations. 
And obviously it didn't happen like that. <laughs> I mean, like I said, we're talking about spandex and puppies. And yeah. it's not it's not like we're getting deep into any of these topics, but it's it's more so for me about like the relationship that we have built and the relationships that have been built off of this podcast as well through like the discord and the emails that we get and everything and the oh, people yeah. that we've met, yeah. the connections that we've made. Like even um, when we had mentioned a few weeks back, uh, Kenny Thatcher as our photographer of the week, mm -hmm. like he wrote a blog post on his website. He was ecstatic about that. Like that, oh, that so one cool. little like 10 minute, five minute, 10 minute clip that we had done talking about his work. He, let me pull that up a minute. Cause, cause I, I just think it was awesome. Like what he had said about it. I of course deeply appreciate it. And he was like, he, so he writes a huge honor is the title of this. And he said, last Thursday, I was featured as artist of the week on one of my favorite photography podcasts, creative banter episode 95. I was blown away by the encouraging words about my work on this awesome show, which I've been listening to for about a year now. Hannah and I were driving to our friend's house for lunch when she played the episode on her phone, and I almost had an out-of-body experience hearing them talk about my work. It was surreal in the best possible way. And That's so cool. He goes on for another like two paragraphs or so, but yeah. But still, like having that, having those comments alone and those little glimpses and everything. Like, yes, this, this podcast isn't about to blow up in any capacity like we were no. talking about before uh, we start recording. But yeah, it's one of those deals of it's the relationships that have been built because of this and like just having the little moments like that, like that just, I, I don't know. It, it's just, it makes me feel good with what we're doing. And I, of course, deeply appreciate them and hearing about them. Yeah. And like I said, even if it's not, perfectly aligned with my goals it's like it's not like this is going to help me to make the fine art books that i want to make or to be a self-sustaining or self-sustained artist in the way that i want to make that happen but it's still doubling down on the relationships aspect of my life which is yeah. and and the connection aspect which is something that is deeply lacking uh, at least for me and i think for a lot of people because we just are so focused on this, like, like every, everything connected wise is just through the phone and like texting and that kind of deal. You don't necessarily call people anymore or no. have hour long conversations like this, just about things that you're enjoying in your life. Yeah. So, and, and I think in, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, originally seeing it as a podcast about, you know, f deeper philosophy and stuff. I don't know. I, I think that a lot of things are fairly simple, at least when it comes to the, uh, especially the more like landscape photography side of things. I mean, there, there, there's some threads in there, but I, I don't know that there's much that could necessarily be explored on a deeper level on a continual basis. Um, and I do think it's interesting how um, you know, with the the various people who who've listened and interact and stuff, it it I, I think what is happening is it's it's building this framework for something that you at this point in time you don't necessarily know what that framework is being built for, but it, I think it'll serve a good purpose for you as you continue to evolve. And it's one of those things where you, you don't quite know what you're creating as you're setting out. And you might think you're creating one thing, but you end up creating something entirely differently. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the interesting things about this. Um, but, but also like when it comes to like the featured artists, um, I know that when I was first getting started in terms of putting the stuff on YouTube, anytime that I would see growth was as a result of word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I think that has been a, it's been a, good addition to the podcast because that gives that sense of word of mouth to other people as well. And again, building that that framework for whatever this leads to. And the other thing too is like what we think we're saying, we're just blabbing about, you know, spandex and puppies. <laughs> but I, I think there might be some people listening that are thinking, they're, they're seeing these like more philosophical threads among the stuff. I'm like, well, I didn't see that. I mean, I just, yeah, I'm just talking about my, my colorful spandex. Um, so I think there is also something to be said in terms of 
the perspective of people listening versus our perspective and just, you know, scribbling down some notes for some stuff to talk about for the week. And, and, and also, I, I think there's a lot of value in the conversational type podcast, not trying to preach to people or tell people how to do things or anything like that, but uh, just a voice to have in someone's ear. Because as you were saying, you know, it's, it's more of a greater solitary sense in, in modern society brought on by smartphones and stuff. And I know that when I go on backpacking trips, I mean, I, I love listening to long form podcasts because mm-hmm. it just has like the sense of you're listening on, on a conversation. You feel like you're part of that conversation. Um, so I think that's another another aspect of it as well that, um, I don't know, that that I think it can be appreciated. That's why like, uh, I'll listen to podcasts on these like longer drives and everything that I do, especially, or even while I'm at the gym. And my girlfriend thinks I'm crazy for listening to podcasts at the gym, by the way. But oh, I totally do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's for me, I find the most enjoyment out of the ones that are more conversational, like you said. Like even that the interview that I was listening to today didn't feel like a traditional interview. It felt more like two people just talking back and forth about topics that they enjoy. Like obviously there were questions that led them through these conversations, but like throughout certain points a lot of times Tim would just throw it back at um at Chris and just be like, "What do you think on this? Like, what are your perceptions?" Like one at one point because uh the interviewer Chris is like starting to get more popularity starting to get more fame and everything more name recognition that kind of deal and Mm -hmm. tim has already been there and tim was just like well instead of asking me like you're going through it tell tell me what it's like like that that to me is more interesting because like you said it's kind of like you're sat there with them listening and you have that uh that accompaniment in the car with you as you're driving or whatever that's just makes it I don't know, less lonely, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I have no idea where this podcast could go or where it is going to go, what will happen to it in a year from now or two years from now. But I just like the idea of, like I said, having this reliable source to bounce ideas back and forth off of and to chat about what's going on in life, because I think that's just as important as talking about the nitty gritty of photography or the creativity of it because in reality this is the creative life like it is dealing yeah. with puppies and spandex and it is it is <laughs> yes. trying to figure out like your diet because your diet affects your mental health and your mental health affects your creativity and like you said it's they're all interconnected yeah exactly there are so many like threads that you can be pulling from throughout all of these conversations that even i'll look back while i'm editing or while I'm taking down notes, I'll look back back at the notes that I've taken, and I'm like, "Oh, here's one, two, three different ideas for an article in the future because I can really expand on these ideas, like on these these threads, and really pull them and weave them into something that could be quite beautiful and and long form and beneficial to a decent chunk of people." Yeah, and 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 also I. I... I find it a little bit amusing because I, I was just looking up. I'm like, all right, so this is going to be episode 99, right? Yeah. And, and we're just saying like, yeah, we, we don't really know what we're doing here. We're, we're just, we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure things out. We thought this would be something. It's, it's not that, um, but whatever it is, it's, it's might be something someday. Um, but I think that's but, you know, like 99 episodes in, but yeah. I think that's the fun of it too. Like, <laughs> Oh, for sure. Like you think if, if this was so rigidly structured, yeah, there's just like, I love the, various like tangents that we find ourselves going on to like like this right here like this this alone (laughs) is right now what a 15 16 minute tangent because i listen to a podcast on a dealer trade yeah it's just i don't know like i said it's just one of those things that it's just i don't know it's it's just like life it's just like everything in life we are just making it up as we go and emmy is freaking out in the living room behind me and don't know why time is it yeah uh, my dad might be on yeah <laughs> so on a little bit of a, a related note um so about two weeks ago um i was watching the the cbs sunday morning news which is news for old people oh okay um, that explains it yeah 
it comes on early in the morning, but it's, I, I enjoy watching it because it's not just doom and gloom. It, it's a lot of human interest stories. Okay. And it's also a nice peek outside the bubble of typical stories that I would end up coming across. Because like with, with social media, you know, like uh, several episodes back, I had mentioned how just before we started recording, I, I was watching this video of this, you know, human powered flight contest and stuff like that. And, and we talked about that. And then ever since then, I'm getting nothing but hang gliding crash videos because it says, oh, you watched human power flight. So you must want to see people on hang gliders crash now. I'm like, no, this is, this is not what I want. <laughs> it's the complete opposite of it, what I want. I want to see them succeed. <laughs> Exactly. But it's like whatever's the most dramatic, whatever yeah. is the Negativity most you know, attention getting. Exactly. But like, that's the weird thing about social media where you end up in this bubble of whatever the algorithm thinks that you want to see and it keeps feeding that to you over and over again. Um, and I think especially during the pandemic when, you know, that bubble got smaller and smaller and smaller because we weren't exposed to the people in the workplaces as much and everything else. And then you get this, you know, significant confirmation bias thing going on. But all, all that to say that I, I enjoy watching the the news show on CBS on Sundays because it's a, a peek outside that bubble. And you hear voices from people that you might not have sought out in the past. Um, but this was, there was a, a story on, uh, they called it The Importance of Being Lazy. It was based on a book from the author Celeste Headley. Um, where in 2017, she was pretty much a workaholic and hit a wall. And so she quit her job and then took a cross-country train ride to do nothing. Um, and it started talking about basically the importance of leisure time, the importance of doing nothing, and how so much of that is lacking in uh, today's society, especially with the, the hustle culture and all the stuff we've talked about in the past. And that is something that... I have a real tough time doing nothing. Um, even this past, so the past two weeks, um, I, I finished all the work I had to do with regard to the images, the videos, the ebook, everything from my, uh, my winter trip. And for the past two weeks now, I've had no work to do, which is certainly something that you're familiar with to you know, some degree yeah. based on some of our past conversations. Yeah, definitely. And, and I fill the time by like, I'm going for more bike rides, I'm skating more and all that sort of stuff. But there, there was one point when I just like went and like laid in the hammock and I'm like, I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to do nothing. I can't shut off my mind. I'm, I'm looking up at the clouds going over and it's having me think of like when I was in Death Valley and I watched some clouds go over. Then suddenly I'm thinking about, you know, other uh, work related stuff, but it doesn't mean necessarily that I'm going to be doing work. But it just, it's so hard to escape that mindset that there is something that I should be doing right now, that there is something that if I'm, if I'm not doing that thing, then somehow I'm falling behind and these things are piling up on top of me. And then I have, I have to take a break every now and then and realize, no, I, I'm good. I, I, I literally don't have any work that I need to do right now. And I'm just, you know, waiting for that window of good weather before going on the backpacking trip. But it, it's a tough mindset to, to get around just because I, I think of how everything is, is set up these days. And, and I miss the times in the past when, you know, you, you get off work and then you're, you're done. You don't have to think about anything. But, you know, there's, there's definitely pros and, and cons to it all. Um, but I, I did find that to be interesting, um, you know, the importance of being lazy. Um, but I, I would also say it's the difficulty of being lazy because it's, it's tough to do. So one thing that I'm that I've been working on and I don't I don't think we mentioned it last week but it'll be apt to mention it now actually with the release date of this episode. So for NPN I am starting to do a monthly digest that's called Dodge and Burn. Mm -hmm. And this is something that David and I came up with when I started to express to him interest in more of doing like a monthly column, but not not being entirely sure what about. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like this. I mean, yes. most of my life is not knowing what the hell I'm doing yeah. and just trying different things and seeing what happens. But uh, yeah. 
Oh, so, creativity, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but we were talking and we ultimately came up with, again, what is, called, what is going to be called Dodge and Burn. He announced it in a newsletter, I want to say, last week. So I'm working on this, what will be the first essay in it, and I've decided to kind of talk about focus. And by the time that this uh, episode here goes live, the digest, the essay should be live as well. As I was thinking about focus and like the out of focus in photography and in life, and I was going through my notes that I had taken from three separate books that I read, uh, Stolen Focus by Johan Hari, which as popular as it is, I really just don't care for Johan at all in terms of an author or a writer. Um, I'm not even, not even familiar with him. He, there's a lot of criticism around him. Some of the, um, some of the sources that he used uh, are not the most credible, so I don't quite understand why he would bother to use them. Like one, the one that example that I draw from is in Stolen Focus. He mentions um, that IQ can be lowered by weed usage, and the source that he pulls from is from a private source privately funded study, all of these things that point to the fact that this source is not credible, and yet yeah. he includes it. So I have issues with him. I have a lot of criticism against him, but the information that he has in the book is obvious enough that it's like still credible. Um, but I was also going through my notes for Deep Work and Slow Productivity, both by Cal Newport. And as I'm thinking about focus and thinking about writing this article, it's just like you said, the the idea of just being bored and like trying to slow down and trying yeah. to do nothing is can be very difficult. Like, but a lot of that I think comes from, as Cal would say, like the slow productivity and the pseudo productivity uh, regime that we have set up in society that I talked about a few episodes ago. But it's one of those deals that the amount of free time that we have these days, for the most part, we are filling with distraction. And Oh, for sure. Yeah. And as soon as we start to, or the more that we distract ourselves, like if I'm editing this podcast and, oh, I got a ping on my phone. Let me check it real quick. Hold on. Let me see what... <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so, but every time that we do that, we start to crave that distraction more. And so then we're more likely to pick up our phone whenever it goes yeah. off or even when it doesn't go off, like, oh, are you sure that I didn't get some? I could have swore I got a message here. But yeah. it's it's just like sugar. It's like caffeine. It's an addiction to distraction. And like our ancestors, like even 50 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, people could sit with their own thoughts and be more content than what we can now because it was forced upon you. You didn't have that that ability to be so like constantly doing something all the time. And if you did, it was you were doing something like, I'm going to pick up a book and I'm going to read because that's going to fill my boredom. Or I'm going to write, I'm going to draw, I'm going to work outside in the yard, I'm going to do something with my body. Like Nowadays, it's not quite like that. But it's just when you are, when you allow yourself to get bored and kind of like what I'm trying to get at with this essay a little bit, or at least I think so, as I'm still finishing everything up with it yeah like as you when your mind is bored and when you just sit with that boredom and you just let things happen you start to make those connections and like you like you had said you were laying in the hammock and you were looking up at the clouds and you start to think about your time in death valley when you were doing something similar and yeah. you start to pull these threads and these threads can become these great creative projects or even just daydreams of while you're just sitting there doing nothing they could spark different ideas for future things to do, with future writing, uh, future essays to write, or uh, photographic projects to work on. It's just a matter of working towards doing nothing, even though it, for people like you and I, it, it kills us. Like I, yeah. I sit at my desk most days for most of the day because at least by sitting at the desk, staring at my computer, it doesn't matter if I'm watching YouTube or just literally staring at the screen, I feel more, more productive than if I were sitting on the couch reading. Like it, It's a very screwed up mentality, but hmm. it's how my brain works that I'm trying to actively shift. So 
try, actually doing nothing is like, and knowing just sitting there and staring at the clouds would drive me up a wall. But yeah. it's something that I need to try and force myself to do because, like I said, there's there are a bunch of deep connections that you can really start to pull from and start to make as you are thinking about various things. I I do wonder if like the the whole thing of you know, reaching for a phone and picking it up and just, you know, doom scrolling to, to fill the time. I, I do wonder how much uh, of the effect is simply having the, the interrupting the process that would otherwise take place in terms of maybe your, your brain shifting into something else uh, and, and having, you know, not having that distraction. But I also wonder how much of it is seeing what other people are doing and then realizing, oh, I should be doing that too. Or, or you know, because because in the past before the phones, I mean, setting aside the, the distraction component of it, you don't really see people doing other things. You know, if, if I'm just sitting there in the hammock, you know, maybe my, my neighbor's mowing the lawn and I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should mow the lawn. That'd be kind of nice. <laughs> um, but I'm not seeing like someone out, you know, backpacking through some canyons where I would like to go. Then I start checking the weather and I'm like, oh, so the weather's good and pretty good. So I, I, I do wonder how much of it is witnessing other people doing things in ways that we are not as a species evolved to have that much input versus how much of it is simply just distracting the process that would otherwise happen in our brains. Yeah, that's true. Like that goes along right with the news too that you were talking about. Just trying to get eyes on various things and we just have that in a, in a sense it come it goes alongside of that negativity bias of but it's a negativity towards ourselves more than it is towards others like yeah we aren't doing enough so we are the bad or we're, we're doing bad we're doing poorly like we need to be doing more like i watch the i'm watching this video of uh, Thomas Heaton in photographing in Spain. And I'm not in Spain photographing right now. Instead, I'm sat here at home just watching a video of someone else being productive, doing something. Yeah. yeah. Even though I'm sure Tom has just as many periods of time where he's just no idea what to do, just feeling that same or similar way of as the rest of us. I, there's, there's something else that, I, that I've, I've had in my notes here for a little while that... I think might be an interesting topic. Back when I was first getting into photography, I remember there was, and I don't remember what the service is now, but there was some sort of print service where you could order large size prints from photographers who had submitted their images to it. And it was something that, you know, you would, you would pay for, but I knew the person who created the website and they said, hey, you know, you can choose any of these prints and, you know, I'll, I'll send it to you so you can kind of get a feeling for, you know, what the print quality is and stuff. And, and I remember it was, it was a photo uh, taken at twilight at White Sands, what is now White Sands National Park, but it was White Sands National Monument at the time. And it was, I guess, you kind of the, the typical white sands blue hour photo with the rolling hills of white sands there's a yucca in the foreground there's a gradient in the sky i have no clue who took that photo i wouldn't even be able to find it now i don't have that print anymore but i still have that image in my head i think there was there was a moon in the background as well um but i was, I was thinking about how that one photo did have a bit of an impact on me in terms of at the time, I wasn't really thinking of, you know, taking photos during twilight. I was thinking, oh, it's, you know, sunrise, sunset, the, the strong light and, and the golden light. Um, but when I saw that, I'm like, oh, this has such a nice, calm feeling to it, nice color palette. But I have no clue who shot the photo. And if I were to look at that photo now, which I don't even have access to, I wouldn't be able to find, I would imagine that I would look at that photo and not have anywhere near the same reaction to it. I would probably see it, oh, it wasn't all that great of a photo. Or there's there's something not quite right with the composition or something along those lines. And but I thought it was interesting how I have this image in my head that I can't compare to the actual photo. And but that photo is still an inspiring image to me. But I guess my question to you on this is are there any photos that you can think of that had an impact on you as you're getting into photography that 
you can think of right now that you do still have the ability to, you know, look up that particular photo and how whatever your experience is looking at that photo now versus when you remember seeing it for the first time. I can't really say that there are any for that. Like looking back when I was first getting in photography, like a lot of the inspiration that I was taking was from more portrait photographers yeah. uh, because that's what I was immediately interested in. I wanted to be like the next Peter Coulson. <laughs> like, top. Oh, interesting. I, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted yeah. to be like major fashion, black and white fashion photographer kind of deal. Like I think back to um, to Peter Coulson, to Danny Diamond's John Shell, to name like my three top influences at the time. And then when I got into uh, landscape photography, it shifted over toward you to uh, Thomas Heaton, Nick Carver, some of those guys. Yeah. Obviously, Ansel Adams being like the stereotypical yeah. one, but yeah, he's like the level boss. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, but no, I I can't say that there are any photographs that that are similar to the experience that you had with yours, either that I can or can't look up any longer. Yeah, I don't know. Like the the only yeah. photograph that's like right now I I know there's a photograph from Peter Colson that obviously is a more fashion photograph that I will always love. Beautiful tonality of the photograph. It's beautifully composed. Every, everything is just very memorable. It's a um it's a blonde woman on the beach. The dunes kind of on the background, the real um, overcast, stormy cloud sky. Um, it's just burned to my memory. But yeah. I don't have something like that with landscape photography. And I'm not quite sure why that is now that I think more about it. Like, is it just because the, the influences that initially struck me are color photographers? And so because of working in black and white, I didn't have oh, I that see how same that could be, connection. Yeah, that could be an impact there, yeah. Uh, or is it more so that because I grew up in the era of Instagram and being inundated that's, that's what I was thinking by everything well. else. Just tons like, of images. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, don't get me wrong, there are certain photographs from from you and from other guys like Chuck Kimmerly and that influenced me in a certain way, but I think it's more so the way of working the portfolios as a whole that are more influential than a singular photograph. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking as well because, you know, this was in, uh, had to have been the early 2000s where, you know, we didn't have social media. So, what you would see in terms of photos was based on what you'd see either in photo books, which was like this high prestigious, you know, accomplishment, or you'd see it on like a photo forum, which is typically photos taken by people more so at your own level, where there's, you know, as digital came about, there's a whole group of people that were, you know, learning very quickly with how fast you can learn with with digital. So kind of a, a, among your peers versus this seemingly unachievable level. And that, that's why it was fascinating for this one, because th this photo was from someone that was somewhere in between. But yeah, it'd be very fascinating to be able to see that photo now. I'd probably look at it and I'd probably be like, oh, it's not all that good. Because I, I think I was more so easily impressed by the images that were out there, just because there was a lot less of them in that regard. So I think that in itself is is certainly a pretty big factor in in that difference. I also see how there could be a situation where if one was looking at the work from an established professional, someone who has a pretty lengthy career, a very significant body of work, and you might just look at the photos and not think too much of them as you're getting started. But then the other angle is if you revisit that work as you're a more accomplished photographer, you'll probably see those photos in a different light and maybe have a lot more respect for, for the work at, of what's something that seemed like it was a very simple photo. I can see how 
maybe if I was ex, um, exposed to more of like the small scene photography, um, I, if I saw that when I was first getting into photography, I don't think I would have been impressed. Like, just like some of the pictures I take these days, like, oh, here's some grass. <laughs> when I was getting started, I'd be like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a photo of, of grass, you know. I think that's um, the other thing too that plays in, at least with, with why I don't have a key photograph in my, like burned in my retina for landscape work is that a lot of the photographers that I was first influenced by, like I have never really been huge into the grand scenic photography, the the kind of stuff like that photo that you're talking about that immediately captures your attention. Like, yeah. That, that's the kind of stuff that on Instagram, on social media uh, is would sell. It's the kind of stuff that people would gravitate towards, whereas the smaller scenes aren't necessarily, they're not as immediately impactful. They take a little while to like really sit with you and to sink in. And yeah. so they may not have that like lasting effect because you didn't give them enough time for them to last. But. I don't know. Yeah. And also on, on a little bit of a related note before we get to the feature photographer and also a, a potential giveaway winner, um, there was a, uh, I had posted my film reveal video for my winter trip and the, the second subject that I photographed um, on that trip was the, the partially dried mud. And, and I took three photos of that scene. There was one that was a safety shot, which was when the sun was still fully above the horizon and it's a pretty contrasty scene. And that's the, that's the um, one with the, um, the rock in slightly above center. No, this, this is actually, is that um, different one? this is actually the same area, but this is a different one. This is like the, the mud tiles, but they have like these dark dots in the middle of them as they're kind of partially drying and okay. like the ridges right. that are kicking up. Um, but I took three photos of, of that scene. Uh, but one of them was the, the contrasty light where I'm like, this is, pushing it for transparency film. Um, but I always take that safety photo. And I took one as the sun was partially obstructed by the horizon. And I took one as the sun had dropped below the horizon. And so exact same subject, exact same composition, just three different forms of light. But what I thought was interesting is that uh, some people that were commenting on that video were saying that they really liked the first one with the harsher light and how that one to them stood out the most. And I, I think that's one of the interesting things about doing the film reveal videos because I'll have my own perception about the images. And it's interesting to hear the thoughts um, that other people have. But there were several people that commented saying that that was their favorite when to me, that photo is kind of like trash to me. Like I, I, <laughs> just, I don't like it. But the, the reason for it is that like, I don't like the feeling it gives me when I look at it. It just, it has a kind of an, a, a, a little bit of a abrasive feel to it. And it just does not match the feeling I had when I was standing there. Um, but I can see how for some people, they see that one as being a bit more dramatic and the images that are a bit more dramatic are going to stand out more compared to ones that aren't. Um, and I went with the one where the sun was partially obstructed by the horizon, where it's a more diffused, low angle, warm light, uh, which I think balances a lot better because for me, that gives a better feeling for when I was there. Um, but I, I do think that was interesting to, to, to see how people will react to the images. And for me, that's one of the values when it comes to uh, YouTube or social media, just have that other input. But it also, it doesn't sway my own mind because I know that, you know, for, for me, it's all about having a photo that matches my feeling of being there. To me, that's one of the, the huge, huge aspects of, of that. Yeah. It's just you following your gut and doing what feels right to, to you in that, in that yeah. instance. But yeah, I did. I watched that video, I think yesterday, uh, finished it up and saw all the comments going off on uh, saying about how they all love that photograph that you were talking about. That yeah. That's the better I'm alternative. Like, eh. Eh. So you're all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're all wrong, but in the, the best of ways. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so I hear we have a, a winner for the, uh, the secret giveaway. Yes. Which almost wasn't so secret because Spotify sucks. <laughs> 
The AI is taking over the world. I know. I didn't realize that it was going to... Uh, I didn't realize that I didn't have that, like, chapter thing. It, it's not even a good software for something like this, either. Like, it's great for, like, a basic interview, I guess. But for a podcast like this, to have that is kind of dumb. Because it, it had this giveaway as one of the chapters, which I'm like, okay, well, it's a secret giveaway yeah. but i mean at least you got the fact that it was a guy talk giveaway yeah. uh, it spelled the name right too which is impressive yeah, exactly and yeah. then, but like some of the other ones were just very odd in terms of what chapters they had but anyway that's turned off so it won't happen again to try and ruin things but we had 14 people enter in for this so i have their names email addresses and such randomized over here and we're just going to go and pick a number between 1 and 14 using random.org and generate. And it's number 13. So who is number Lucky 13? number 13. So that is Trevor Sherwin. So Whoa. Trevor, I will send you an email. Uh, I'm going to wait to do it until this episode comes out because... It'd be a nice little surprise. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to ruin anything. Uh, yeah, but, like the AI did. Yeah, Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I will uh, send you an email probably next Thursday. So by the time that you're listening to this, you should have an email in your inbox waiting for you saying, hey, look, you get a book. <laughs> yeah. So there we and go. We'll, 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 do, we'll do more of these. Um, I think once I get back from my uh, backpacking trip, I'll have to make an inventory of some various things I have to perhaps use as, as the giveaway stuff. So I, I think that'll be a fun little addition to the to the podcast. Yeah, definitely will. In other news then, who do we have for the featured photographer this week? All right. So this week, um, as I always find the featured photographers, just scrolling through Instagram and looking at stories and looking at people's work and everything. And so I stumbled upon Anna Morgan who has absolutely beautiful work. Uh, she is from Canada and um, a lot of beautiful small scene photography, beautiful light, some just very creative thinking. So I, I, I absolutely loved going through her work. Looks like she was featured in uh, Elements Magazine. She was also a part of Nature Vision Magazine, our first issue. Yeah. She wrote something for us as well. And you're, you're mentioning that she was part of uh, the Ask Me Anything? Yes, that is true. Somehow I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was just, she just did a Ask Me Anything on Nature Photographers Network. So I will provide a link in the show notes for that. No longer active uh, in terms of you can't ask questions on the thread anymore. But if you are a member, you can look back and uh, see what she all answered i i actually have to be i want to go back and do that myself because she is a photographer that she is doing some really beautiful beautiful work here and also i should i should say that on on instagram she's anna morgan photographer and then her website is uh anna morgan.ca yes for, for people playing along at home yeah so and on her website speaking of she has free ebooks, including a Zion one. Yeah. 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 She just came out with that. One of the photographs in that ebook that I absolutely love is uh, called Earth Falling that she had taken in 2023. It's um, January 11th, posted on Instagram. And absolutely beautiful photo. It is. Her eye for the small scenes, for abstract uh, scenes, is just unparalleled. It is. Yeah, really, really impressive stuff. Yeah, and, and that that particular photo looks. I mean, it's a a view of oil on the surface of a puddle with kind of a a shadow that makes it look like you're looking at Earth from outer space uh -huh. with a content with a continent of some sort breaking the pieces. Absolutely beautiful work. And the sort of thing where it would be hard to find a scene like that without looking through a viewfinder and putting a rectangle on it. I mean, because that's the sort of thing where you have to be aligned up in just the right absolute way in order to see that. So it, it, it really shows spending time with a subject and 
knowing you know do, doing that very purposefully yeah <laughs> i think is is the key and that's something that takes time wandering around and and really spending time with the subject and there's just so much detail in this photo too like the little i think they're like dead butterflies that are just floating there's at least one if i'm seeing that correctly in it and just oh yeah looks like a like a moth or yeah it could be butterfly or moth it's hard to tell but yeah yeah that would just yeah that's a, that is a photograph that has been on my mind for quite a while now ever since i did see it back when she had originally posted it on here um but she's got some other ones too that are just really really nice abstract photographs of like various oils or frozen uh frozen water that kind of deal yeah, and I, I was checking out before we were recording, I was checking out the uh, the Zion ebook that she has on her website. And it was it was really it was really awesome looking through all of her work from there. And I, obviously it's an area I'm very familiar with, but I absolutely love seeing how other photographers um, see an area that I'm very familiar with. Um, because it's often a very different way that they see it. I mean, so, so many things that she photographed, I would have walked right past. Yeah. And, and to me, that's, that's a sign of a extremely talented photographer who has their own sense of vision about a scene. Um, and so that was, that was, that was very, very cool to look through. And it looks like, um, when I was reading the book, she, she said that she was there for about a week. Um, so that's, and that's a good amount of time to really just get out and explore and, and stumble upon some really, some really awesome stuff. She has another photograph that it's, I would love to have a print of, and I really should at some point uh, get one from her, but it's in her arboreal gallery and it's titled The Pear. It's of a pine tree with two pine cones splitting off from a single branch, vertical composition, and just the, the quality of the light on it, just how she worked the photograph, worked the scene to really draw your oh, yeah. eye to those those cones. It's just, it's gorgeous. Yeah. It has it has a lot of depth to it with the lighting. Yes. Um, yeah. With the, the, the light areas moving forward and also getting that, that bit of color contrast um, between the green and sort of the, the, the rustish colors of the other parts of the pine trees. But then those, those cones are just hanging there per perfectly as though they're like, hung as like i don't know, like christmas decorations yeah, or something like, like that mistletoe. Along, yeah yeah along with this um enough negative space in the photo and actually the longer you look at it the uh pine and i guess it's like the the flowering parts of of the pines they start looking like people like the longer <laughs> you look at it it looks like a crowd like crowds of people that just kind of it, it's yeah it has yeah. and that's it that's a thing about photos where it starts to become something other than what it is. Um, and I think that's, that's a fascinating part of photography. I hope you enjoyed our creative banter. You can learn more about Cody's work by visiting his website, codyschultz.com. And you can find my work at benhorn.com. For further discussion, join us at patreon.com slash creative banter. It's a place where we can interact with you, the listener. And although we greatly appreciate those who contribute by joining a tier, discussions are open to everyone, whether you're a paying member or not. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you around next time.